Hello, hello. I just wanted to go over in this video my workflow for subdomain automation and finding subdomains and how to keep finding subdomains and stuff like that. Um, the one thing I'm not going to talk about in this video to put it out there is permutation um, and finding using permutation to find DNS or finding subdomains because I'm going to do that in a future video and make that a whole video. So that part isn't in here. I will talk about where I'm gonna put that part in and then we'll talk about it in the next video or in a future video. But that is the only part of the workflow that's not in here right now, but will be added in in the future. So I wanna make it quick. I tried to make a little chart here so it kind of makes sense what I'm doing. Um, go ahead and use it yourself. Go ahead and change it. I'd be really interested to hear if there's something you guys do that I don't do or something you do in a different order. Um, that you guys think would be interesting, let me know in the comments, Twitter, or whatever. Um, it's super cool talking to you guys about it and hearing from you guys, so let me know. But getting started here at the top, obviously you have your seed domains. Um, I guess I should also have another disclaimer that I only really run automation on like basically pure wildcard scopes. Um, there will probably be a some like, uh, you know, distant future where I work with programs that have excluded domains and stuff like that, where I can like weed them out and I put that into my automation to, to have exclusions, but for now I don't. So I only really use this automation on programs that are basically wide open uh, or have at least have seed domains that are wide open. So keep that in mind if you're gonna use it is that it will find everything and it will, you know, some of the stuff will just test everything and probe everything. So keep that in mind. So I start with seed domains. Uh, it could be something like uh, tesla.com or, you know, Yahoo or, you know, whatever it may be. We had a video about finding more of these seed domains using acquisitions, using stuff like that. So go look at that video if you haven't. Um, but once you have your list of all those seed domains, those are the kind of things that I'm gonna plug into the beginning of my workflow and it's gonna start at the top. Um, tools really don't matter to me. So I didn't really list a whole bunch of tools. We'll rattle through some of the ones that I use or I'd recommend use if you're getting started. Um, so passive enumeration, obviously you have Subfinder, um, Amass has a passive mode. Uh, there was like Sublister back in the day. There's, I think Bbot is this like new one people are seeing you can use all the passive sources from uh, Recon for the win if you want. You can go through and configure it to only be passive. Um, whatever you want to do, there's so many tools out there to do it. Um, but I do strictly passive enumeration first, um, which gives me uh, results that I put into a list called all subdomains. Um, like for me, it's a table in a central DNS it, or a central database. It could be a text file if you really wanted to, but normally something like this is going to probably grow beyond the scope of a text file and it's going to get annoying. Um, and you can get a managed database in any cloud provider very cheaply. I would recommend you just do that and figure it out, put up some tables, throw stuff in tables, um, makes it a lot easier to query the database and pull domains you want. That's just me. Um, but I start out with passive enumeration, put it in here. Um, the other thing I didn't put in this list is active enumeration. If you want to brute force, brute force all you want. Um, there can be a step right here, right next to it for brute forcing that will put domains into here. Um, the only reason why I don't put brute forcing into here is because technically this all subdomains list is just domains that are coming from these passive sources, meaning if you can't tell from the next step coming up on the screen, they're technically not resolved. Like they may actually be down or taken down or not up right now or you know any of those things. Some of these passive sources don't give you 100% of the time domains that are up anymore they could not all be up. So normally when you do brute forcing, right, you generate a list of domains you want to brute force and then you brute force them with a resolver and you try and resolve which domains are actually there, right? So technically speaking, you could put the list here and dump it into here. I wouldn't recommend it because you're about to resolve it again here. Um, so you would probably do, you know, your active enumeration up here. Um, the only reason I don't talk about active is because one, everyone has a different opinion about should you use the 10 million thing word list and run it for days and days and days on thousands of threads and try and get those extra th three subdomains, like sure. Um, it will probably get you stuff that you haven't found, um, but I'm not gonna go in depth on 
how I do active enumeration. I do do brute forcing on the side, just like how I do active enumeration when it comes to um, permutations and stuff like that. So that will all be a separate video on how I do all of that active stuff. This is just something to get you started, something really easy, really straightforward. The passive stuff works really fast. I think if you have no API keys in Subfinder, it runs in like one minute for most subdomains or most domains, seed domains. And even if you do go through the work, which I recommend you do, of grabbing all the API keys and putting all the free API keys in Subfinder or a mass or something like that, I think they both will still normally run, even if you run both of them in like 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes max. Um, and that gives you a big list of subdomains for some of these companies to work with where you know you can save a lot of time versus sitting there waiting for 10 million possible maybe subdomains uh, to resolve from your active enumeration. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it because I do it um, and we're gonna go over it in another video. But passive enumeration leads you to this list that I call just all subdomains, right? Because you don't know if they're resolved, you don't know what's on them. You just know that somehow these tools, these passive enumeration sources you're accessing think these subdomains are a thing. Right, so you take that all subdomains list and use your DNS resolution tool of choice, mass DNS, pure DNS, DNSX, um, anything, right? Tools are limitless, pick your tool, pick your purpose, go for it. Use your resolver list you wanna use, use your tool list you wanna use. Um, there's so many out there. Uh, side note on DNS resolution, um, I would pay attention to the resolvers list you use. I'm not gonna tell you which one to use, um, but I would either find some of the research of people who are using daily updates for theirs. I believe 6.2.des has a daily updating list now of resolvers that he uses from a bunch of different sources and some of his tools. Super awesome guy, super awesome tools that he makes. I would 100% check out those resolvers lists and you could obviously just use those if you wanted to. Otherwise, find your own. Um, but using a big resolver list that you found that's current will normally get you a few extra results as well. So I would recommend doing that as a side note, but you take all your subdomains, you put them into DNS resolution, right? From here, one of two things happens, right? They either don't resolve or they resolve. Now, when I say resolve, what I personally look for is anything that I can use in the future. So I'm gonna look for takeovers and I'm gonna look for websites. So when I resolve, I query for all the stuff that that could be, right? A, a quad A or an A uh, record, a C name record, an NS record, and I mean technically an MX record, right? I resolve for all that kind of stuff because all that kind of stuff can either be taken over or it could be a sign that it's pointing to something that might have a website on it that you can use for web automation testing later. Um, you know, so I don't look for text records and stuff like that. You can if you want to, um, I don't. But again, resolve what you need. And anything that resolves, I put in a new list or table if you're using a database. Uh, you, you call it whatever you want, but it, I call it resolve domains, right? So I have my all domains list, and then this resolution actually lowers it to uh, resolve domains. Now, obviously, like let's say there's like 100,000 domains here. This list is probably gonna be smaller, right? Because your passive domains list, once it goes through, um, DNS resolution, there's probably gonna be less of them that actually resolve. The ones that don't resolve, I'm against what a, what a lot of people just kind of let fall off the wayside. I do not just get rid of them. And I wanna stress that enough. If they showed up in a passive enumeration tool, odds are they probably existed at one point, right? So you should probably hold on to it. So if it doesn't resolve, I just let it sit here in this all subdomains list because what I do is I do this DNS resolution daily or weekly or whatever you wanna do, and one that maybe didn't resolve that I held on to, maybe in a week, all of a sudden is alive again, right? And you're the first person that sees it resolve. Okay, so it's super important and I don't see a lot of people talking about it, but when you find something and it doesn't 100% work out or resolve or you know, have a web server sitting on it right away, especially when you're making automation that's just doing stuff for you anyway and you don't have to worry about it, just let it sit there and keep testing it and keep looking at it, right? I mean, if you want to, you could have some kind of logic there that's like, okay, I'm gonna try and resolve it, you know, 60 days in a row and if it doesn't resolve in 60 days, I drop it. But in reality, holding on to as many possible subdomains as you can 
really only benefits you in the long run, especially when we do get to that permutation step. A lot of permutation is based off of, you know, trends and how they're naming their domain. So even if the domain doesn't resolve anymore, you can use this all subdomains list to make really, really good permutations in the next step that we're going to talk about later when it comes to active stuff um, and active subdomain enumeration. So I would recommend at this resolution step, if it resolves, great. Put it in your resolved domain list. Perfect. If it doesn't resolve, I would still hold on to it in that all subdomains list and, and it just builds you a database full of possible domains, right? Now, this red is gonna be a different video, of course, but now with these resolved domains that have records on them, those are the ones that I'm gonna run takeover tests on, whether it's subdomain takeover, name server takeover, zone takeover, all the different you know, imaginable you know, mail server takeovers, whatever you wanna test for, all of that testing is all at a DNS level that I like to do. So this is the domain list that I'll use for that because I know they have records that I've already seen or that I know are there. Um, and I can do it for that. At the same time, so that goes to the right, that moves over, red text, different video. Okay, down, we take those resolved domains and we port scan and we see what we find, right? There's really no, like, if it doesn't find anything, put it like, you know, they stay in the list, it's fine. Anything you have that has results from port scanning can go into a new table that maps the domain to all the ports that it has, right? This is where having tables in a database makes a whole lot of sense because you can literally just have, here's the domain and here's you know a string or a list or whatever, um, depending on the you know database structure you're using of all the ports that are mapped to it, right? Now, I don't do a whole bunch of testing outside of web testing, right? So if it's like port, 21, I suppose I could automate some type of FTP testing and whatever, but for now, uh, a lot of the videos are going to be like based towards web stuff. So if I'm doing the rest of my automation against web targets, then I have to find the ports that have web assets on them. So the obvious next step is very similar to what we did before, which is taking your tool of choice, HTTP probe, HTTPX, you know, whatever you want to do, some kind of screenshotting tool, even if you want to go that far into it and just somehow probe all of the ports that you already have. So you don't have to probe all 65,000 whatever ports and look for you know web servers. You only need to do the ports that you know are open. This step of port scanning is just like what ports are available. You're not you know doing the like in-depth end map detection, you're not doing anything like that. Just like send out pings, show me ports that are open, done. And that's how you get to this table. And then from those open ports, you can really minimize the amount of requests you're sending um, to success ratio with your HTTP, you know, HTTPS probing. And again, if it doesn't work the first time and there are no HTTP ports, maybe you still hold on to the information about the domain and the port mapping, right? Because if there's not a web server on port 8080 today for a certain domain that you found port 8080 open, Maybe in a week, all of a sudden, the admin panel shows back up on port 8080, right? You never know. And since it's automated, that's the whole point of automation is we're trying to expand the attack surface and expand the amount of stuff we can look at, check, et cetera, the whole time. So I'd recommend when you're doing this probing step, if you don't find any ports with a web server on it, keep the information, keep the port information. You already did the work to find it. You already have the database or whatever. You might as well keep it, right? For the HTTP, you know, or HTTPS ports that are accessible, those are going to my table with the URL of actual domains that have a web server sitting on them that I can hit, right? And from here, again, much more videos in the future about it, but then those are obviously your targets for web testing, right? Those are the ones you can hit and it's time to go off to the races, right? You can screenshot, you can automate, you can fuzz, you can brute force, you can, you know, we're gonna make a bunch more videos about it and stuff that I, like to do and stuff that I'm trying to build. But for now, this is the workflow that I would recommend looking into. It's the workflow that I kind of have built out so far um, as far as taking seed domain and getting to you know a list of HTTPS or HTTP accessible domains with a URL that I can hit. Um, and along the way, I, I still have domain and port mapping information. So if I wanna go through here, I can still, if I put this in a table, Maybe someday I do decide like, huh, I wonder if any of the domains I have just randomly have port 21 open and I wanna do some FTP testing. 
I can go back into this table and be like, okay, give me all the domains that have port 21 open. And I can still do that later, even though it's not part of my automation right now. If I want to manually look through some of them, I can just pull it out of the database because it's a query that you can make as long as you're creating the tables correctly. So that's kind of what I have so far, right? And this is what I have built out. And again, there is an active portion to this, especially like it doesn't just do this passive part and then move on. Um, this all subdomains part kind of right next to it here, there's an active part of just like, you know, a word list that I use, shove it in, make some guesses, resolve those as well. And any of those that resolve will end up here, um, as well as taking this all subdomains file and do some permutations off of it, try and resolve those permutations, any results going there as well. That's gonna be probably the next video, if not in the very near future. Um, but for now, this is something I would recommend you guys look into. It should be very easy to code, you can just implement and chain together a bunch of your tools in a bash script and end up with something like this real easy. Deploy it and you're off to the races. You need a database, a couple bucks a month. You need a VPS, a couple bucks a month and a bash script. For some of you guys, I know that's no time at all for bash scripting. Maybe it's Python, maybe it's whatever it is. Use some of the tools you like using, chain them together and boom, you have this put together in no time. And all of a sudden you have a whole recon automation set up that you can now use for a bunch of different type of testing and you have a whole bunch of different data. And I'm gonna argue, especially going forward in the cybersecurity domain and especially in like singular research, being a bug bounty or independent research or whatever, um, data is king. The more you know about, the better. So that's really all I had this time. Again, there'll be more in the future. Anything you guys have to add, things you do, things you'd like to see, or things you maybe would even do different, I'm all ears. I'd love to hear about it. Love talking to you guys. Otherwise, I'll talk to you guys later. Peace.